Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Jeffrey Zelks, Kriya Artem, Tony Glass, and two new patrons, Frederick and Jada. Welcome, Yay! Frederick and Jada. On this episode of DTNS, how Google's algorithm leak is neither an algorithm nor a leak, a new watch to make kids stay fit, and why YouTube is letting everyone play games on YouTube. Yay! Yeah. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, May 29th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. In sunny Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. You know, I had made a promise to myself earlier in the year that I was going to every day say, can you believe it's whatever day it was? Mm. Because it always feels like that yeah. every day. Yeah. Can you believe it's can Wednesday? Can you believe it? Can yeah. you believe it's May already? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Can you believe June's right around the corner, Tom? Can yeah. you believe it? Well, I, I mean, you better believe it. <laughs> it is. <laughs> no, I refuse to and believe it. And I hope it. you've I paid your bills. Yeah. I am a June truther. There is no June. <laughs> I did actually this morning be like, like 30 days have September, April, June, and November. Okay, May has 31. Oh, yeah. Got yeah, it. Yeah, I got but... another day. <laughs> Uh, well, Mark Gurman says Apple's working on an Apple TV app for Android in the cat sleeping with dogs category of news. Let's mm -hmm. see what is in the rest of the quick hits. Microsoft's Copilot for Telegram is now in beta and free for Telegram users on mobile or desktop. You chat with Copilot in the app as an official Microsoft bot. There are other bots um, that uh, proliferate <laughs> on other messaging apps. So I think this is Telegram just saying, okay, we're doing it too. Copilot for Telegram is limited to text requests. Can't generate images, not at least at this point. There's also a daily 30 turn limit for exchanges between user and Copilot, meaning after 30 days of back and forth, you start over. Uh, we got new ARM designs in the Cortex X925 CPU design and the Immortalis G925 GPU. Uh, they claim to be faster. You know, they always do. Uh, the X925's single core performance is supposed to be 36% faster than the X4, and it has increased the AI workload performance by 41%, they say. Uh, the G925 GPU is, according to ARM, the most performant and efficient GPU to date. Again, they say that every time. 3% faster on graphics applications compared to the G720. Improved rate Ray tracing performance, including Lumen support for Unreal Engine. So we'll see if anybody uses Unreal Engine in some mobile games. Uh, plus improved AI and ML workloads by 34%. And they say it should use 30% less power overall. Phones with chips based on these designs are expected by the end of the year. GPD, a company known for handheld gaming PCs and not to be confused with GPT, GPD, uh, also miniature mobile PCs uh, from the company um, out of Ohio, in fact, published an image of an upcoming GPD Duo that has two 13.3-inch OLED displays, range of ports, stylus support as well. Scott, you might be interested in that one. Mm -hmm. Stacking the panels so that the extra screen is on top, similar to what Asus has done with its new ZenBook Duo. But GPT has foregone the removable keyboard and kickstand, so the second display can fold behind the main one in what looks like a regular laptop form factor, more or less. It can also fold down into a tablet form factor and support that stylus. The Verge says it appears, at least from some rendering photos, that there is Ethernet, uh, an Ethernet port at the rear, an OcuLink port for eGPU connectivity, two USB, -C, uh, USB ports on the side, and a card reader along the left-hand side of this new laptop. Big, big laptops from GPD. Yeah. 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 Uh, U.S. Department of Justice announced Wednesday that it had led an international effort to shut down the 911S5 proxy botnet, which is believed to be the world's largest botnet yet. Officials are seizing servers, shutting down domains used by the botnet, and the U.S. FBI arrested the botnet's administrator, Yunhei Wang, and seized property of Wang's in Thailand, Singapore, and the UAE, St. Kitts, and Nevis, 
and the United States. Among the seized properties are a 2022 Ferrari F8 Spider SA, a BMW i8, a BMW X7 M50D, a Rolls Royce, a bunch of luxury watches, and a dozen domestic and international bank accounts, as well as two dozen cryptocurrency wallets. Uh, so now you understand why people do botnets. Wong faces a maximum penalty of 65 years in prison. Samsung wants to bring more AI to its smartwatches, starting with the collection of new AI-powered health features for its Galaxy Watch lineup, starting with new watches through its One UI 6 Watch software that is going to be rolled out later this year. A limited number of Galaxy Watches will also get the beta version next month, so you can try it out. A new energy score is designed to make sense of your health readings, as well as a new running and sleep tool. All right, everybody, let's talk about what is going on with Google search and has the company been lying to us this whole time? Okay, 2,500 pages of documents that appear to come from Google's internal content API were posted on GitHub March 13th, a couple months ago. CEO researcher Irfan Azim, CEO and director of SEO for a digital marketing agency, claims that he shared the documents with Rand Fiskin, co-founder of an audience research and marketing company and SEO expert of his own. Thousands of ranking features are described, but not how they're weighted. This offers indirect hints about what Google seems to care most about on its side. SEO expert Mike King looked over the documents and said that to say that Google lied is harsh, but he said it's the only accurate word to use here. Well, I don't necessarily fault Google's public representatives for protecting their proprietary information, I do take issue with their efforts to actively discredit people in the marketing, tech, and journalism worlds who have presented reproducible discoveries. Yeah, so they, that kind of represents one end of the spectrum of reactions here. Uh, but there's another end. Other SEO experts are skeptical that this leak amounts to much. Uh, Ryan Jones, who runs SEO at Razorfish, said in a post on X, we don't know if this is for production or for testing. My guess is it's mostly for testing potential changes. We don't know what's used for web or for other verticals. Some things might only be used for Google Home or news, etc. We don't know what's an input to a machine language algorithm and what's used to train against. I'm sorry, machine learning algorithm and what's used to train against it. My guess is clicks aren't a direct input, but used to train a model how to predict clickability because clicks were one of the categories. I'm also guessing that some of these fields only apply to training data sets and not to all signs. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is a lot of people look at what the category of the API is and assume, okay, so that is important to the, to the ranking of sites on, on search results. And that is not evident. It could be It could that. be true. It could also not be true. Uh, yeah. you, you just don't know by looking at this and it's an internal API. There's some, there's some debate on how old it is. The The documents themselves seem to be from March, but a lot of them are dated 2019. Some people say, well, yeah, they were originated in 2019, but then updated and, and are current. Some people are like, no, these things are five years old. Uh, so, so they're probably deprecated anyway. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of disagreement about whether there is any there there. But the thing I would say is it's not the algorithm itself. We, I see a lot of people referring this as the search algorithm. It's just an internal API list of categories. Doesn't include the weights, as Sarah said. Uh, and it's also not a leak. It seems to have been accidentally included in a, a published bit of code on GitHub. So it wasn't like somebody was like trying to whistleblow on Google. It just accidentally got out there. Yeah, this is an interesting thing because um, you, I, where, where you live in a pretty reactionary society and the first thing you want to do is just jump all over Google and say, well, look, they lied to us or whatever. Um, I see headlines calling this the secret recipe for how search works, which it isn't that at all. No. Um, it also doesn't, like Tom mentioned, really say how some things are weighted versus other things. So we don't really know any of that information. But my overall take on this has been... it. The, these are, no matter what, these are considered things that Google wouldn't want to tell people. So if you're worried that Google's withholding information about how their search engine works, uh, good job, you've guessed it correctly. Of course they do. Um, and why wouldn't they? These are considered trade secrets. They have a lot of competition that would love a piece, a larger piece of the search pie. 
they have no motivation to share how all of that works, the underpinnings. They'll give you just enough for people to do just enough to, to take advantage of the fact that the search engine does have some SEO possibilities. But they don't want anyone completely gaming the system. And even if they could, uh, it's not like they would hold still for very long. Like you said, this is five-year-old data. I don't think stuff lasts for more than a year over there, probably even less uh, mm -hmm. in terms of how things are weighted. It's constantly shifting and moving. And they're not going to tell you how because it's a business that needs this to be trade secret. So I guess, you know, our, our appetite never ends for shocking tech news, but I don't think this is it. I think this is just kind of like, oops, we accidentally posted this. And also, oops, it's five-year-old data. And I say that knowing that Google hasn't even said anything, and we're still waiting for some sort of response. Yeah, there's no sure official we'll response yeah. to this, so we don't even know what Google's take is. I, I don't uh, even think Google needs to respond to this, to be honest. I mean, mm -hmm. um, to your to your point, Scott, you know, of of uh, the 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 concept that the company has been like, you know, just lying to the public. And I mean, if there were five people in a conference room and those were the only people who knew what was really going on, I'd say, ooh, interesting. No, that's not how Google works. Yeah. I mean, thousands and thousands of people have access to whatever we're talking about right now. Sure, it does sound like, huh, interesting. The API works differently than many SEO experts had thought in the past. That is uh, something that Google might be bummed out about uh, that, you know, that that now that more people outside of the uh, enterprise know about this. Mm -hmm. But it's not like, oh, search works differently. And, you know, all of you, you just, you know, you know, peasants never knew what we were doing <laughs> behind the yeah. scenes. This is not much of a smoking gun. I'm not even sure it's a gun. Uh, it might be ammo, but the ammo might not even go in the gun you're talking about. So it's 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 really like, don't forget, an API is just a way for an application to request data from another application to oversimplify. And this document lists here are all the categories you can ask for. It doesn't say what the application will or will not deliver. It doesn't say what the weights in the algorithm that would be asking for this are or any of that. So if you want circumstantial evidence to support your theory that Google has been lying, you will find it here. And a lot of people are. If you want to look at this for primary evidence that Google has been lying or even how Google ranks pages, you won't find that there. It's not in this particular document. No. Oh. Uh, Fitbit Ace LTE is a real thing, though, that you can actually pick up and hold in your hand. It's a fitness tracker for kids that appears to be a bit of a surprise hit. I, I saw lots of glowing reviews uh, come out about this today. Uh, it is for kids, so it's made of plastic and gorilla glass. Uh, you know, not not super fancy titanium or anything like that. Uses the same charger as the Pixel Watch 2. So I guess the idea is if, you know, mom and dad have the Pixel Watch 2, kid can have, you know, a charger that works with it. The key appeal, though, seems to be the fact that it uses video games instead of apps. Kids are encouraged to meet their fitness goals by playing games uh, and vice versa. They get to play games by meeting their fitness goals. So if they add to their step count, they get more video game time. Daily fitness goals earn kids are tech arcade tickets. Those tickets can be used to buy game time and virtual items. Uh, there's a virtual pet called EG, uh, and there's no in-game purchases. There's no actual money. The only way to buy things for EG it's is to, to meet your fitness goal. Yeah, yeah. And get those tickets. Uh, there's a bunch of parent friendly features too. the, the usual stuff you'd have in a kid's watch, uh, calling, texting, location, sharing, parental controls. Uh, but this thing doesn't access the web. So the parental controls are, are pretty simple. It does require a $10 a month subscription. If you want to do the calling, cause LTE is built in, but you don't have to go through a carrier. You just pay, uh, Fitbit and then it works. Location data is only available to parents through a phone app and is deleted after 24 hours, never stored in the cloud. There's also no third party apps, no advertisements. They're not trying to monetize this in some other way. Uh, you spend $230 if you want the connectivity. You spend $10 a month and it's available June 5th. Hmm. This you know, I got, yeah. I, I got to say, I, you know, as somebody who doesn't have a, uh, doesn't have a lot of kids, in fact, has zero um, of them. <laughs> but um, I know, having been a child at one point, that something like this, if it catches on, all the kids want it. If 
if only one kid has the, you know, fun, like fitness watch and, you know, all the other kids either just don't have them or have something else, it, it, it's, you know, DOA. So I think, you know, that, that kind of being impressionable and wanting to be cool and wanting to have something that other kids like is a big part of how successful this is going to be. Yeah, I agree. And I also, I also think, I mean, on the surface, it's a good sell for parents. I don't think most kids have the kind of disposable income where they're going to shell out the two hundred and twenty nine ninety five. dollars no. But if they can go to their parents and make this sale... <laughs> that, you know, it's, dad, it's going to keep me more active and you don't like it when I'm just sitting around. I'll be all doing this because then I can play games because I can, you know, you explain the whole thing. Maybe they'll get it. But my experience has been with kids, my own kids and others, that it has to come from the direction Sarah just said. If the parents are the ones saying, well, this would be great for you, son. You're going to go out and it's going to be great. It's gamified. Uh, you're starting to sound like Steve Buscemi with a, ski with a skateboard saying, hello, fellow kids, right? <laughs> yeah. Like so, what parent yeah. ever said, you know what you should uh, invest in? Roblox. Right. Right. And that, and no kid hears that and goes, yeah, great. Let me get right yeah, on that. Okay. So, so right. some of this stuff, it's a tricky marketing thing to get into. You know, Tamagotchi succeeded. Pokemon succeeded. These kinds of things succeed because they're really smart about how kids are getting the information about the thing they want. In this case, it feels like a little more of a workaround. You know, how are they even going to know? And it's pretty expensive for your average kid to go beg your parents for. So, so I don't know how sex successful this is going to be, but I will say I like efforts in this direction. Um, I mean, Roger, you have kids this age or around yeah. this age. What you, what's your hot take? So it, it's a little from column A and a little from column B in terms of getting kids to kind of glom on to something. Because it's new and you give it to, if I gave it to my kids, they'd be excited for a while, a while being maybe a couple of days, and then they'll lose interest because they'll naturally gravitate toward where, towards where their social life for kids, whatever that might be. Uh, so whether it's on a tablet or it's in a game or physically in person, um, there needs to be some sort of socialized aspect where you can share or you can compare your goals, your scores with uh, you know someone in your peer group. And I would add uh, that it's also a very narrow age range before kids are where kids are either too young for it or kids will be a little too old. Like around junior high, I think they'll probably start losing interest mm -hmm. in something yeah. like this because it's like, well, what do I need for? I have PE. Um, you know, I get all my exercise at school. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, you have one or two, maybe three, if you if you have a if your household set up that way, uh, where this will prove to be uh, uh, useful in that in that regard, but. To appeal to kids, you really do need to kind of have a a socialized. I I can I can measure myself up with my peers yeah. aspect to it. it yeah. Let's think about it from from the other side though, right? Let's say uh, you there's a there's a lot of people we've talked about it on DTNS who are not wanting to give their kids phones mostly because maybe they're not allowed in class and they're not going to be able to use them at school as much anyway, but they'll give them a smartwatch because then they can message them. They can even do some calling on them. What if you're a parent who looks at this as, oh, you know what? I'm going to get this watch instead of a Pixel watch or an Apple watch because it does the things I would buy those others for but it's more limited so I'm not going they're not going to, you know, start wandering around into other apps and you know, maybe they never play these video games, but there's a chance they get bored and do because they've got the watch that I made them wear for the tracking and the calling and the contacting. And then maybe they do start playing those games and they do start, you know, building up their fitness goals. Yeah, it's not a bad point. Like as an alternative to a phone, which you can track phone, like you said, phone call, text, all that stuff. I mean, that makes us a lot more uh, interesting I mean, as yeah. a, from a parent's perspective because I'm going to spend a lot less money on a that. a digital tether fun. to your child. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I mean, again, they would have to be in the age range where they understand how that works. Like my, my eldest is nine. She, she would totally be fine with this. But my youngest is five. I think she would have more difficulty. So, again, you'll have that age range. And once you hit around the junior high mark, kids are going to like, well, well I, I want a phone. I want what? Yeah. I want that. Or, or if it's not yeah. a phone, I want the watch that all the other yeah. kids have. Yeah. You know, and that's like what this the wants whole to idea be. of like, you know, uh, you know, feeding your Tamagotchi esque um, <laughs> uh, you know, pet inside this watch. Great idea. 
if everybody wants to do it, then it's like, awesome. You know, the kids are going to be like, coming to school, let's talk about it. Oh, you know, let, let's, you know, let, let's yeah. compare. But, but the, if it's just you, it's not going to work. Yeah. But you know what? If the parents are like, you have to wear it to stay in contact, a lot of kids will. Kids wear watches sure. right now. You yeah. know what and else you won't do? For fun, you, so. won't, you won't lose it like you do a phone all the time. Yeah. This thing's on your wrist. It's strapped on. I mean, yeah. I would lose it because I lost everything as a kid. But yeah, most kids probably <laughs> will have a less chance of losing it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Hey, if you're a kid or a parent, uh, or both, uh, and you have feedback about anything that gets brought up on the show, uh, get in touch with the DTNS audience on the social networks at DTNS Show on X, at DTNS Show at MSTDN.social on Mastodon, at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, and DTNS Picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram and on Threads. Tuesday, YouTube started rolling out Playables, its casual free-to-play game section, to everybody. Uh, the games were previously only available if you were testing it or if you are a YouTube Premium subscriber. Uh, now, even folks who are fighting ad blockers get to play with Playables. Playable lineup includes more than 75 titles, uh, including some popular stuff. Angry Birds, Showdown, uh, Words of Wonders, Cut the Rope, Tomb of the Mass, Trivia Crack. And players are able to save game progress and track scores across the YouTube app they're playing on. As it rolls out over the next several months, you'll see playables in the Explore menu on desktop and iOS and Android app. Uh, LinkedIn's doing this. Netflix has a version of this. Scott, what do you think of it? Well, it's interesting. I dug in pretty deep on what's available there. And um, I have two major cons to mention first before I get to the pros. One of the biggest cons is that they bury this stuff in the menus. It's the literally on mobile anyway, the last thing in the discovery menu. So you've got everything else in its dog, including a whole grouping called gaming, which is not what it used to be anyway, and is still kind of weird. It's not in there. So don't go there. Those are videos. You got to go way to the bottom and you find this playables icon, which doesn't look like much. It's an icon that doesn't actually say, hey, there's games here. So I think they're a little weird about the launch and about that kind of I stuff. Mean, do you till... think it's probably that they want people who really care to find it first and May give maybe them data? I, it seems to me like if they if they I mean, this is kind of Netflix has the same problem in a, in a lot of ways, because when you go to find the games in Netflix, you usually just run into them by accident. They just happen to be showcased in some sort of banner between other categories. LinkedIn's the same way. Like, they're not front yeah. and center. You they're not, go they're not super easy to find. So I guess these all all these people could use, uh, I don't know, a little more front and center or just even just a... It was kind of hard to find, if I'm honest. Um, and then uh, I also think that uh, the games themselves... I mean, if you go in there looking for Tetris, you better be okay with block drop, Okay. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Is you're you're gonna look at a lot of these like no namey Timu style. And, yeah. <laughs> no offense to Timu, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you it's know like what the I mean. kid who wanted the Apple Watch who gets the Fitbit Ace. It's a little bit, yeah. Um, <laughs> the thing is though, some of these are okay. Like like at their core, they have decent gameplay. I played a bunch of stuff, including Cut the Rope, which is like an old favorite on iOS and Android, and you know that's been around forever, so I wouldn't call it a new game, but it is a more of a legitimate experience. They all play really well, though. They load up really quick. They're just right there. I don't know what these are written in. This looks like HTML5 to me or something. Um, on a technical level, I don't actually know that, but I, I, they feel like apps. They feel like games. And the one advantage they have uh, over what Netflix is doing, as an example, um, is that they are keeping things simple. Uh, there's a ton of stuff in there, so there's a big selection, way bigger than anything that's going on with Netflix. And you don't have to go out and download these somewhere separate. The way it works with Netflix now, no matter what device you're on, it's a little weirder on iOS, but you have to, uh, first of all, subscribe to Netflix. And if you are, well, then go to the, the App Store, download a separate game. It will verify that you're a current Netflix user, and then you've got the game and you play it like a normal app. Um, some people may even prefer that, but I think that's kludgy and weird. This is keeping it all within the same experience. And it's all in there, so you don't have to get out of the app. You just stay in there. My biggest overriding question, though, is who are they going after here? People that go use the YouTube app or are using YouTube online on desktop or anywhere else know why they're there. It's usually to look up a video, follow their favorite uh, creators, whatever it may be, a web series they're inter interested in. I, I don't know that there are people that are on YouTube going, well, I've seen every video I could ever want to see. It's time for some... Yeah, like drop. where's my Farmville? Yeah, I have a I, guess. Yeah. I have a guess why 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 they did this. Mm. They had data that said 
uh, we lose retention. People leave the YouTube app uh, in this percentage of amount. Uh, and we, what can we do to reduce that percentage? Keep people on the YouTube to YouTube app longer. And then they had other data that said one of the first things people go do when they leave the YouTube app is go play a mobile game. And so someone said, what if we had mobile games in the YouTube app? Then they wouldn't have to leave the YouTube app to go play the mobile game. Brilliant idea, Bob. Mm. Uh, let's put mobile games in YouTube and see if it works. I think I agree. This is a very fly on the wall thing, but if you were a fly on that wall, it sounds like something I would have heard as well. And I think that, and I think it's fine. Like I don't think this is going to hurt their service. Um, keep adding more. I think if I kind of what I expected was that they were going to maybe add some games that you couldn't get if you're a subscriber of YouTube Premium. Um, we haven't seen that yet. Maybe they still will down the road. Maybe there'll be more. I don't know, double A titles or something that's a little less uh, simple. But as it stands right now, I think it's a fine addition. Make it a little easier for people to find, I, though, because if you want to retain them, you got to show them where the thing is you want to retain them with. I, I will add one thing. I'm wondering if this is also aimed at people with limited connectivity, whether they're paying on a monthly plan for... Uh, a, a, a certain a quality of service. Does it run locally or not use bandwidth? Or I, I I managed one run one run locally, but I don't know if it's uh -huh. just buffered on uh, my phone. But they're not they're not in very huge games. Yeah, uh, and no. so you do hurdle. Have to, have to, have to, have to, yeah. <laughs> hurdle block drop. Yes. You may have heard of it. Dog not Eater even Man. close yeah. to another game that a lot of people like. We're just but offering that to you. It's, my it's last question is: Name a platform that's main business wasn't games that added games that still has them, and it's a big deal. It's actually kind of hard to do. Like Facebook should have been your example, but they quit yep. doing that. No, YouTube yeah. has had games before, yeah. as a better effect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and then got rid of them because you mentioned the Farmville earlier. Farmville started on 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 Facebook. On Facebook, Fa and yeah. Facebook had a ton of games going for a oh, long time I mean, there. But you know, and at in its heyday, Farmville very big deal. Oh, well, it was huge. Yeah. It's still very, influential. Very, very, there very there are still many apps, including Farmville itself, that have multiple sequels and are very yeah. popular on the App Store. But apps kind of took over, and this is WeChat making a, is the only one I could think of. Yeah, I and this it, is making it has a bet. more to do with you know it. More to do with where people hang out online, and less to do with is the game fun still. Yeah, right. Yeah. This like is the game was fun, but people were just like, eh, no more farm. This is making yeah. a wager that says we think it's flipping the other way a little bit, and we want to be yeah. here for that flip. Because right. yeah. uh, back and in they've the day, got enough cash to burn way. that it's a low risk effort to yeah. do these kinds of. You know, what's the worst case? You just drop it in six months, like they do most yeah. of their gaming stuff. It's fine. <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Mike in steamy uh, Dubai wrote, I loved your analysis on EV sales. He's talking about uh, yesterday's show that we had with Charlotte Henry. On people holding off on an IV, Mike says, it's me. I'll be moving back to the U.S. and considering selling my 2017 ICE car internable uh, combustion engine. However, the slow roll out of adoption of the NACS in non-Tesla cars has me holding off knowing the resale value will be lower for EVs without it. I'd be lying if I said that Musk's antics don't weigh in on my decision not to buy a Tesla. But more worrying are complaints I'm hearing about reliability on newer Teslas. More importantly, the sudden shuttering of the charging unit has given me concern about how much I'll be able to rely on other Tesla features and the future of that charging network. Mike says, as somebody who wants to put my money where my mouth is on EVs, I will sadly hold off for a year or two to see how the charging network and standards end up working out. Um, for, first of all, the, the, the charging network layoff is partly because it is being uh, outsourced and standardized. So I think that gets a little bit of an overreaction from some folks. Um, but your your concerns are perfectly reasonable. And we got concerns from multiple people uh, that said, you know, here's why I wouldn't want to buy an EV right away. But I would like to, again, as I did within the show yesterday, remind people the story wasn't that EV sales were slowing in the U.S. The story was that EV sales are not slowing in the U.S., that it's grew 23% year over year in Q1. Now, that's not as fast as it was growing in the past, but it's picking back up. It's gaining momentum. So the story wasn't, oh, the EVs, e people aren't buying EVs. The story was, if you heard that people weren't buying EVs, turns out that was a very momentary blip and people are buying EVs. So let, let's not lose sight of that part of the story. Yep. Indeed. Um, we will not lose sight of you, Scott Johnson, mm. because you're just 
going to be part of the Sunday too tall. barbecue you at all times. <laughs> Six foot three. It's hard to <laughs> lose sight of me. And the Wednesday show most of the time. Sure. Uh, let folks know where they can keep up with you. Sure. Uh, if you're looking for a range of podcasts covering everything from video games to morning shows, movies, personal stuff, everything in between, boy, do I have good news for you. Check out frogpants.com. There's a whole podcast section. And if you're there for the artwork, well, you can look at that too. All of it is there for the taking. So check it out today. That's frogpants.com. Indeed. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. You may be wondering, are you going to talk about Helen Toner, the ex-OpenAI board member, spilling the tea about what happened at OpenAI when they tried to get rid of Sam Altman? Uh, yes, we are going to pour Darjeeling all over the show in Good Day Internet, uh, talk about how the company operated during her time, what she told the podcast, and what we think about it. So stick around, patrons, for that. You can also catch our show live Monday through Friday. That's when we are live, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back doing it all again tomorrow, talking about how close we are to the AI apocalypse with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>